Welcome and thank you for joining us for an exploration of assessment and evaluation in the Elementary Health and Physical Education Curriculum webinar. My name is Kristen Burfeld and I'm a project leader with OSEA. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. We invite you to stand and move around throughout this webinar recording as we connect and learn together. And we also invite you to follow along as we tour the 2019 Elementary Health and Physical Education Curriculum. Today we will be hearing from Hattie Moon and Andrea Hayfley who will be sharing information on assessment and evaluation in the 2019 Elementary Health and Physical Education Curriculum. And we'll be, we will be taking a specific look into Strand A, Social Emotional Learning Skills, based on questions and feedback from folks as an area of interest for this webinar. This is part of a webinar series to support the implementation of the curriculum. And we invite you to visit ophia.net backslash webinars to learn more. Hattie Moon is an educator with over 23 years of teaching experience with the York Region District School Board. She is currently the Curriculum Coordinator of Wellbeing in Healthy Schools, and for the past five years, she has led the district implementation of social-emotional learning, where elementary and secondary schools learn of evidence-informed approaches of SEL that are comprehensive and culturally responsive. Hattie uses she, her, and hers pronouns, and she asks others to use these pronouns in reference to her. Andrea Hayfley is a health and school education teacher in the New York Region District School Board. She is also an OCEA ambassador and an Ontario Association for the Support of Physical and Health Educator, or OASI, member. Andrea has been part of many regional and provincial initiatives that support the health and physical education curriculum, healthy schools, and also daily physical activity. She is a strong advocate for quality HMP programming for all students of all abilities. Andrea uses she, her, and hers pronouns and asks others to use these pronouns in reference to her. And today we will be hearing from Andrea first. By the end of the hour together, it is our hope that you will have an increased awareness of the assessment and evaluation direction in connection with Strand A, Social Emotional Learning Skills in the 2019 Elementary Health and Physical Education Curriculum have increased knowledge and understanding of key assessment and evaluation concepts within the 2019 Elementary Health and Physical Education Curriculum. Have a clear understanding of additional resources and further sources of credible information to support the assessment and evaluation of the 2019 Elementary Health and Physical Education Curriculum. To begin the webinar, we want to make sure that everyone has a solid understanding of the principles and policies that apply to assessment, evaluation, and reporting practices, not only in all programs, but also in H and PE. Growing success, assessment, evaluation, and reporting in Ontario schools, first edition, covering grades 1 through 12, 2010, sets out the Ministry of Education's assessment, evaluation, and reporting policy. The policy aims to maintain high standards, improve student learning, and benefit students, parents or guardians, and teachers in elementary and secondary schools across the province. Successful implementation of this policy depends on the professional judgment of educators at all levels, as well as on their ability to work together and to build understanding, trust, and confidence among parents or guardians and students. I'm going to pass it on to Hattie. The assessment is the process of gathering information that accurately reflects how well a student is achieving the curriculum expectation in a subject or course. So according to the Growing Success Document of 2010, assessment for the purpose of improving student learning is seen as both assessment for and assessment as learning. As part of assessment for learning, teachers provide students with descriptive feedback and coaching for improvement. Teachers engage in assessment as learning by helping all students develop their capacity to be independent, autonomous learners who are able to set individual goals, monitor their own progress, determine next steps, reflect on their own learning and thinking. Teachers can use a variety of assessment methods and tools to collect these data, this can include formal, informal observations, conversation, project performances, peer and self-assessment, and self-reflection. Evaluation refers to the process of judging 
the quality of student learning on the basis of established performance standards and assigning a value to represent that quality. Evaluation also accurately summarizes and communicates to parents and guardians, other teachers, and students themselves of what students know and can do with respect to the overall curriculum expectation. So in other words, evaluation is based on assessment of learning, which provides evidence of student achievement at strategic times throughout the course, often at the end of a learning period. In order to ensure that students are given equitable opportunities for assessment of learning within the curriculum, Educators need to create an environment that promotes important educational values and goals that support the development of character. And this includes striving to achieve one's personal best, equity and fair play, respect for diversity, sensitivity and respect for individual requirements and needs, and good health and well-being. We'll be sharing some examples of what assessment can look, sound, feel like within the context of the health and physical education that focus on social emotional learning skills later on in the webinar. We're now going to spend some time just looking at the different principles found within the health and physical education curriculum and the seven fundamental principles from the growing success. The fundamental principles of the health and physical education emphasizes that a quality health and physical education program provides multiple opportunities to learn through creative work, collaboration, hands-on experiences. These principles in the curriculum enable the implementation of a well-planned, inclusive, and high-quality program. No major updates were made to these principles from 2015 to 2019. However, it continues to be important for us to understand these principles and apply them. So I'll just read through what these principles are. It is health and physical education programs are most effective when they are delivered in healthy schools and when students' learning is supported by school staff, families, and communities. Physical activity is a key vehicle for student learning. Physical and emotional safety is a precondition for effective learning in health and physical education. And learning in health and physical education is student-centered and skill-based. And finally, learning in health and physical education is balanced integrated and connected to real life. And then when we look at the seven fundamental principles found in the Growing Success document, it is important to keep in mind that these primary, the primary purpose of assessment and evaluation is to improve student learning. Student sh teachers should use practices and procedures that are guided by these seven fundamental principles to ensure that assessment, evaluation, and reporting are valid and reliable and that they lead to improvement of learning for all students. And when these principles are fully understood and observed by all teachers, they will guide the collection of meaningful information that will help inform instructional decisions, promote student achievement, and improve student learning in all subject areas. So we're now going to give you an opportunity to pause and to reflect. Now that you've looked through these two, had an opportunity to look through these principles, we're going to ask you to just think about what common themes that you see in both documents. And now I'm going to pass it on to Andrea. We would like to take a moment to highlight the update in the 2019 H&PE curriculum and how it impacts assessment and evaluation. The chart on the slide was extracted from page 24 of the 2019 HMP curriculum document. The chart illustrates how the expectations for health and physical education are organized into four distinct but related strands. A, strand A, social and emotional learning skills. Strand B, active living. Strand B, movement competence, skills, concepts, and strategies. And strand D, healthy living. This chart shows the flow of the learning through the curriculum and the interrelationships among its various components. On the right side of this slide, you will see the broad categories of learning, strand B, C, and D. On the left, strand A, while small, there are arrows from the social and emotional learning skills strand. Take a look at the white boxes. This strand helps students develop social and emotional learning skills to foster overall health and well-being, positive mental health, 
and the ability to learn, build resilience, and thrive. In all grades, learning related to the expectations in this strand occurs in the context of learning related to the other three strands and is assessed and evaluated within these contexts. In the social and emotional learning skills, you will recognize that many concepts from the living skills of the previous health and physical education curriculum. The social and emotional learning skills update the living skills in ways that benefit students' mental health and healthy development as evidenced by current research. This presentation is focusing on assessment and evaluation, including how the SELS trends are evaluated through the h and curriculum. For more detailed information about the SEL content, please refer to the webinar we held in November with School Mental Health Ontario, which is accessible through the link we are including later on in the chat. We have an important opportunity as h and teachers. Our program provides a unique setting for developing the social and emotional learning skills that will help students gain a better understanding of who they are and help them connect positively and productively with the larger world. A direct integration of these skills with other components of the h and curriculum gives students an opportunity to develop, practice, and refine these important skills as they mature. Ensuring that this trend is properly assessed and evaluated as it was intended will and ultimately support students in the development of these skills. Mandatory learning is described in the overall expectations and, specific expe and the specific expectations of the curriculum. There are two sets of expectations, overall expectations and specific expectations, which are listed for each strand or broad area of the curriculum in health and physical education for grades one through eight. If you take a look at the slide, the strand includes strand A, social and emotional learning skills, and three content strands, numbered B, C, and D. Taken together, the overall and specific expectations represent the mandated curriculum. The overall expectations describe in general terms the knowledge and skills that students are expected to demonstrate by the end of each grade. As you can see in the chart on the slide, everything stated in strand B, C, and D are the overall expectations. These are the expectations that are to be evaluated and reflected on the report card. The specific expectations describe the expected knowledge and skills in greater detail. The specific expectations are grouped under numbered subheadings, each of which indicates the strand and the overall expectations to which the group of specific expectations correspond. For example, B2 indicates that the group relates to overall expectation 2 in strand B. All those corresponding specific expectations under each overall expectation helps with the assessment so that the teachers can collect a variety of products, observations, or conversations in order to assign an evaluation for the overall expectation. This organization is not meant to imply that the expectations in any one group are achieved independently of the expectations in the other groups. The numbered headings are used merely to help teachers focus on particular aspects of knowledge and skills as they develop various lessons and learning activities for their students. I'm going to flip the next slide over to Hattie. So let's take a closer look at Strand A, Social Emotional Learning Skills at a Glance, which can be found on page 292 of the appendix. The strand helps students develop SEL skills to foster overall health and well-being, positive mental health, and the ability to learn, build resilience, and thrive. Learning related to the expectations in this strand occurs in the context of learning related to the other three strands, active living, movement competence, and healthy living, and should be assessed and evaluated within these contexts. In other words, these skills must be explicitly taught and evaluated in the context of learning in all strands of the curriculum. The SEL skills are, in, are the same in all grades. Because these skills are directly integrated into the expectations of other strands from grades one to eight, 
students can, will be provided with multiple opportunities to develop, practice, and refine these skills as they mature. The health and physical education curriculum provides a unique opportunity for developing FEL skills that will help students gain a better understanding of who they are and how they can connect positively to the larger world. The ministry website also provides an overview of the FEL skills for each grade. Here is an example of the FEL skills taught in grade one across strands B, C, and D. As you can see, within the healthy living strands, when students begin to show an understanding of and respect for themselves and their bodies by using proper names for body parts, they can also develop their skills related to developing their self-awareness. When students learn how to get help so that they can be resilient in emergency situations, they can also develop their skills related to coping with stress. Within the active living strand, you can see when students learn how to speak respectfully and pay attention to others when sharing equipment, here's an opportunity for them to also develop skills related to building healthy relationships. So you can clearly see that the SEL skills are purposefully integrated into the teaching and learning of the other strands within the curriculum. In our board, in York Region District School Board, we created charts that mapped out where the SEL skills were integrated into the specific expectations of the other three strands. And what we noticed was that depending on the grade, some strands had specific SEL skills tagged only once, while other strands connected with multiple SEL skills. With this understanding, educators may need to use their judgment and teach SEL skills in these strands in places other than where noted in the curriculum. This highlights the importance of planning your instruction and assessment, knowing what you're looking for, providing opportunities for students to show what they know in all strands, and integrating SEL skills where it makes sense. Now I'm just going to hand it over to Andrea. The SEL, SEL overall expectation from grades 1 through 8 states that, in order to promote overall health and well-being, positive mental health, and the ability to learn, build resilience, and thrive, students will, A1, apply to the best of their ability a range of social, social emotional learning skills as they acquire knowledge and skills in connection with the expectations in the active living, movement competence, and healthy living strands for this grade. The learning in this curriculum, including the development of social emotional learning skills, is age related but not age dependent, and a wide range of individual differences may be observed among all students. As they would with all students, educators work with students who have special needs to identify what the learning might look like in different contexts. On this slide, we provided a pause and reflect question. What are some program considerations we need to keep in mind when assessing SEL skills in the H&P curriculum. Students with disabilities and or special education needs. Please pause the webinar to pause and reflect. I will now throw it back to Hattie for the next slide. There is a National Practitioner Advisory Group on using data to inspire SEL practice. A group of leaders, including educators, came together to understand how we're implementing, assessing, and refining SEL practices. Based on their experience with SEL and assessment, they offer 10 insights for consideration, compensation, and exploration. Here are five that we would like to highlight. We need to ensure that we assess strengths and not deficits. All students present their unique SEL strengths in different ways and in different settings. Information from our assessment should not be framed in a way that highlights areas should be framed in a way that highlights areas of strength rather than areas that they are lacking. In other words, we collect information that should only inform and improve our instructional practices, not diagnose, identify, or categorize students. We need to create a positive culture and climate. The SEL of our students is influenced by the setting and environments we create. As educators, we need to create safe, healthy, and inclusive learning environments where all students feel that they belong and matter. As mentioned in the curriculum on page nine, we need to create learning environments that recognizes and respects the diversity of all students and accommodates individual strengths. 
needs, and interests. Implement and assess with an equity lens. This means that SEL needs to be implemented and assessed in a way that reflects the assets of our students, their identities, their lived experiences, and their strengths. It has to be culturally relevant and responsive. Educators need to reflect on their own attitudes, biases, and values with respect to the topic that they are teaching. And we need to ask ourselves, are we teaching, modeling, and, and assessing SEL through an equity lens in order to mitigate bias and promote appreciation of diversity? Measure for growth and not endpoints. When assessing SEL skills, we need to measure for growth. We need to remember that these expectations, as Andrew mentioned, are age-related but not age-dependent. And the readiness of students will depend on their individual physical, social, and emotional development. Therefore, we need to make sure we are using developmentally appropriate assessments as our students develop and mature. And finally, we need to provide feedback to continuously improve SEL skills. So in order for students to reach their potential, they need to receive progressive instruction and constructive feedback, as well as numerous opportunities to practice, reflect, and learn experientially in a safe environment. Using a variety of assessment data will also help us to improve our instructional practices and be responsive to the needs of our students. We're now going to give you an opportunity to pause and reflect on this question. How are these belief statements reflected in your health and physical education programming and planning in the context of SEL skills? And now we're going to use this opportunity to look at some examples of how SEL skills are embedded in the health and physical education. Educators are responsible for using effective and structural strategies to help students achieve their curriculum expectations, as well as appropriate methods for assessing and evaluating student learning. Teachers bring enthusiasm and a variety of teaching and assessment strategies to the classroom that addresses students' needs and ensures sound learning opportunities for every student. These learning experiences should enable students to make meaningful connections between what they already know and what they are learning. Teachers should reflect on the results of these learning opportunities and make adjustments to them as necessary to help every student achieve the curriculum expectations to the best of their ability. The following are examples of assessment evaluation with a specific focus on how SEL skills are embedded in the program for primary, junior, and intermediate divisions. And I'm going to pass it on to Andrea. Before I go on to the next slide, we want to note the following. We should also keep in mind that there are different models in how health and physical education is delivered from school to school. For example, in some schools, there is one designated health and physical education teacher, while other schools may have one physical education teacher and one health teacher. Every teacher, and then in other schools, there might be a model where every teacher teaches their own health and physical education curriculum. It is important to highlight that teachers need to work in collaboration to ensure that there is a common language and understanding on strand A, SEL skills, so that students understand how it is embedded into the whole curriculum and beyond, versus just in isolation. Although the social-emotional learning skill expectations remain the same throughout all grades, the approaches and strategies used to help students build these skills vary with the developmental level of the students. In the primary division, students are at early stages of developing their sense of self while also learning to identify and manage their emotions and feelings. Learning in this division is therefore focused on skills related to self-awareness, identifying and managing emotions, and learning to cope with challenges. At the same time, primary students are also beginning to develop relationship skills and critical and creative thinking. The curriculum provides opportunities for learning beginning relationship skills, including ways to communicate respectfully with others and basic problem-solving processes. Here are some primary examples from educators that have embedded SEL skills into their assessment and evaluation practices. On this slide, there are two examples of learning goals that show how strand A SEL skills are embedded into strand C, movement competence. 
Having shared learning goals and success criteria with students is an essential step in assessment for and as learning. On the left is a grade two learning goal that reads, we are learning to send an object over a net with love to create a rally. In this physical education unit, students were given multiple opportunities to explore how to send in an object to their partner in order to create a rally in net and wall games. The teacher uses the co-created word love to help them understand how to send the object gently with kindness, control, and respect for the other players to help them be able to successfully return the object back. Throughout the unit, students were asked guiding questions that connected the learning expectation from the SEL skills strand and the movement competence strand. For example, describe how you had to send the object to ensure your partner receives it. And as you can see in the success criteria below, the students have co-created, I can send the object with the right force, not too light or too hard. Another guiding question the teacher has asked, what kinds of words or phrases did you say to your buddy to ensure that they were able to receive your object? And if you can take a look at the success criteria below, it says, I can use nice words. I can tell my buddy to be ready. On the right side of the slide is a grade three learning goal that reads, we are learning to use skills and strategies in net and wall games. In this physical education unit, students were exploring the difference between the concept of skill versus strategies and how they are interconnected in net and wall games. Throughout the unit, students were also asked guiding questions that help prompt the student's learning to embed expectations from strand A, SEL skills, into strand C, movement competence. For example, a teacher has asked, what can you and your partner do to increase your chances in creating a continuous rally? And if you can take a look in the success criteria below, it says, I can move where the ball goes. I can make a prediction to go where the ball goes. Another question the teacher has asked, describe the best way to send the object to help your partner receive the object. And once again, take a look in the success criteria below. It reads, I can send the object in a rainbow, meaning it can go over the net. I can communicate with my buddy. As you can see in both pictures, the educator was able to ask intentional questions that connected to the games and activities to facilitate the student's thinking in relation to address the SELS skill expectations, A1.1, identification and management of emotion, A1.4, healthy relationships within the strand C, movement competence. It is important to remember that the curriculum intends that the SEL skills are to not be assessed and evaluated in isolation, rather it is embedded in the program planning and delivery within strand B, active living, strand C, movement competence, and strand D, healthy living. In this slide, there are examples of culminating centers in a grade two physical education class from the net wall unit. Students are given specific tasks in each center that connect back to the learning goal in the previous slide. We are learning to send an object over a net with love to create a rally. Within each center, students were given the opportunity to transfer their SEL skills. A1.1, identification of management and emotion of emotion. A1.4, healthy relationship. Within the strand C, movement competence into each of the centers. Having centers allow multiple opportunities for students to practice their SEL skills. A1.1, identification and management of emotions. And once again, a 1.4 healthy relationship in a variety of net wall games. This setup gives the teacher an excellent opportunity to work with small groups as essential steps in assessment for and as learning. Gathering information about students learning during and near the end of the period of instruction and also give and receive specific and timely descriptive feedback about the student's learning in connection to the learning goal and success criteria. And it also pro provides an opportunity 
for the teacher to analyze and interpret the evidence of learning. The teacher also provided opportunities for students to self-assess how they transfer their learning of the SEL skills within each of the centers. Students are provided a recordable learning tool called the Ladder Self-Assessment, as you can see in this slide. This resource can be found in the OFIA Teaching Tools Recordable Assessment Chart. As a class, the students have the opportunity to discuss possible challenges that may happen at each of the centers. For example, not being able to send the object over the net to their partner, not being able to create a rally with their partner, or even having trouble using a specific implement to send the object over the net. Students then co-created what managing their emotions could look, sound, and feel like when playing netball games for themselves for the levels one through four. Within each center, students were given the opportunity to transfer their SEL skills, A1.1, Identification and Management of Emotions, and A1.4, Healthy Relationships, within the strand C movement components into each center and self-assess how they were coping when facing challenges alone and when working with their peers. There are a variety of cognitive and behavioral approaches when it comes to addressing self-regulation for students. The zones of regulation is a cognitive behavioral approach used to teach self-regulation by categorizing all the different ways we feel and state of alertness we experience into four concrete colored zones. This approach to categorizing complex feelings that students experience improves their ability to recognize and communicate how they are feeling in a safe and non-judgmental way. It is important to note that this is best implemented in small group settings. In this slide, the physical education teacher has created a mindful moment area in the gymnasium. At any time, students in the class are able to take the mindful moment card to use the area for a break. Having this intentional space in the gymnasium gives students the opportunity to recognize a range of emotions that may occur during physical education class, learn how to gauge the intensity and or the level of emotion, learn how to manage strong emotions and use strategies to self-regulate, and also it allows students that are not expected to share how the, note that students are not expected to share how they are feeling unless they want to. This is a physically and emotionally safe space the teacher has set up. There was a lot of collaboration between the physical education teacher, homeroom teacher, and the support staff that teach this particular class to ensure that everyone has a common understanding on how the mindful moment area is to be used. The teacher did a lot of free teaching with helping the students to identify and manage their emotions in order to improve their ability to express their own feelings and understand and respond to the feelings of others. Students have the choice to use their words and or the colors to express their emotions. During physical education, the teacher allows the students to go to the mindful moment area on their own terms and to use their choice of strategies in the toolbox that were co-created to help the students return back to the green zone ready to learn. It is important to create a physically and emotionally safe environment for all of our students to apply to the best of their ability a range of social emotional learning skills in health and physical education and other subject areas too. This is a key pillar when building the fundamentals in health and physical education. For students in the junior division, relationship skills assume increasing importance, and therefore there's an emphasis in this portion of the curriculum on developing the communication skills, social skills, and behavior needed to work effectively with others. At the same time, students will continue to develop their identity, increase their awareness of self, and further develop skills in identifying and managing emotions, managing stress, and embracing optimism and positive motivation. They will also continue to develop critical and creative thinking skills as they learn to use clear processes for making decisions, setting goals, and problem solving. Here are some junior examples from educators that have embedded SEL skills into their assessment and evaluation practices. 
In this example, the health teacher worked in collaboration with the homeroom teacher to ensure that the students have a common knowledge and language of what adaptive and maladaptive behaviors are, along with understanding how to regulate these behaviors. This was purposely explored in the beginning of the year to set up norms and establish common language to support students' emotional mm -hmm. learning throughout the year, while learning specific expectations within strand D, healthy living. Adaptive behaviors refer to the behavior that enables a person to get along in their environment with greatest success and least conflict with others. The opposite of that is maladaptive behavior. On the left, the health teacher worked with students on exploring a variety of case studies that allowed the students to get a better understanding of these terms. It is important to remember that the entire health curriculum has expectations from the SEL skills strand built into it. By explicitly highlighting SEL learning at the beginning of the year as a way of, to set norms and common language supported the programming and planning of the healthy living strand D expectations. For example, in grade six, there are two curriculum expectations in that grade six healthy living strand D 1.5, connecting thoughts, emotions, and action, strand D 2.3, faith and positive social interaction, conflict management, and both of these expectations connect directly to SEL skills learning and the norms and language learned will naturally support new learning in these expectations. On the right-hand side of the slide is an example of students' work where they had to articulate how their own brain and body feels in the different road signs so that it could help them identify and manage their own emotions and behaviors in a healthy way. Students have the opportunity to explore how, as individuals, they experience a range of emotions. If you can take a look at the examples on the slide. They have the opportunity to, to self-define what it looks, sounds, and feels like in each of the zones as this gives them ownership to express their feelings and understand the feelings of others around them. It was important for this teacher to establish the norm that everyone experiences emotions differently and that the way each individual experiences them is valued and recognized. In this example on the left, the students have the opportunity to explore means of animals that show different emotions as a mind-on activity. The health teacher presented the pictures and had students add short sentences describing situations where they felt that way. In the picture of the cat sleeping on the keyboard, some students' responses were, how I feel when I have no one to hang out with, when I realize all my assignments are due tomorrow, my mom made me stay up to do chores, in the picture of the happy dog, some student responses were, I woke up rested and not grumpy. Our teacher is telling us something interesting. I love my weekend. On the right-hand side of the slide, students were then given the opportunity to describe their triggers that connect their thoughts, feelings, and actions to a specific emotion. This activity is an assessment as learning tool to not only help students develop their capacity to be independent learners while monitoring their own progress, but it is also a tool to help the teacher learn more about the students and the behaviors and individualized emotions. In grade six, strand B, healthy living, there are two curriculum expectations. D1.5, connecting thoughts, emotions, and actions. D2.3, faith and positive social interaction, conflict management. Both of the expectations connect directly to SEL skills learning and the norm and language learned will naturally support new learning in these expectations. In this activity, this is a concept, this is a concept on social behavior mapping. The health teacher led the students through a thinking routine that allowed them to explore what is expected when chatting online with real friends. What are expected behaviors? How do your behaviors make other people feel? How do others react to your behaviors? What do you think they are thinking, saying, and doing? How do you react about yourself based on how people react to you? In the first column, expected behaviors, 
when chatting online with real friends, some of the students' answers were friendly text, sending emojis, reminding me of the homework. In the second column, labeled how your behaviors make others feel when chatting online with real friends, some students' answers were respectful, safe, and welcome. In the third column, labeled how people react to your behavior when chatting online with real friends, some students answered, I am thinking that this person is respectful. I say you're cool. I say thank you. I continue chatting with the person. In the fourth column labeled how you react about yourself based on how they react to you, some of the students' answers were, I feel like I have friends. I think that went well. I tell them that I will see them tomorrow. Teaching students the concept of social behavior mapping breaks down social expectations and allows students to explore how the behaviors affect others. This understanding directly supports learning about positive social interactions and how to manage or avoid con conflict. This activity addressed SEL skills A1.1, identification and management of emotions, and A1.4, health, healthy relationships within strand D, the healthy living strand. In the intermediate grades, there continues to be an emphasis on developing relationship skills. There's also a focus on recognizing and coping with stress and challenges in positive ways to build resilience and an attitude of positive motivation, developing self-awareness and self-confidence in order to nurture a sense of identity and belonging, and applying critical and creative thinking skills in deeper and more complex ways. Students will have opportunities to practice processes for solving problems, setting goals, resolving conflicts, and making decisions. They will also continue to develop their awareness of emotions, intentions, and motivation as they communicate and interact with others. Here are some intermediate examples from educators that have embedded SEL skills into their assessment and evaluation practices. As part of developing mental health literacy, Students learn to distinguish between mental health and mental illness and building an awareness of the impact of stigma associated with mental illness. Establishing norms within the SEL skills strands helps set a foundation for talking about mental health as it helps in the preparation for the transitions that come with adolescence. The health teacher embeds many opportunities for students to reflect on their mental health, whether it be about stress, relationships, and life in general, creating a safe environment for students to comfortably and honestly reflect, share, and discuss will make learning about health expectations more meaningful and purposeful. Understanding, recognizing, and learning how to cope with stress and challenges in positive ways supports students in the development of their awareness of emotions, intentions, and motivation as they communicate with and interact with others. This activity addressed SEL skills A1.2, stress management, and coping. In this activity, students were given the task of tracking any stressors they have during the week and any coping strategies they have tried to use when dealing with that stressor. Following this was a class discussion on what worked for students and what didn't. If you look on the Friday row, you can see stressor, all the work I have missed and due date. Coping strategy, thinking about how am I going to use my time wisely, how I felt afterwards, feeling less stressed and feeling more calm. This activity is a good assessment tool to inform instruction for the teacher, guide next steps, and also help students monitor their progress towards achieving their learning goal. SEL skills A1.1, identification and management of emotion, A1.2, Stress Management and Coping Within Strand B, Healthy Living, B2.4, Demonstrate an Understanding of How Incorporating Healthy Habits and Coping Strategies into Daily Routine, such as Starting the Day with Physical Activity, Limiting Screen Time Before Going to Bed, Using Tools Such as Online Apps to Support Mindful Practices, or Even Using Deep Breathing and Grounding Strategies, can also mean help maintain mental health and resilience in times of stress. Following the activity on the previous slide, the students learned about Canada's 24-hour movement guidelines. 
Students then had an opportunity to analyze and interpret their weekly stress reports. They co-created personalized goals that focus on four core areas, sleep, exercise, leisure, and food. In the left example, the student analyzed where they were at in each of these areas. Then in the example on the right, they set personal goals to improve their sleep, exercise, leisure, and food, eating habits. These activities are great tools for assessment as learning. Students self-assess their goals and their achievement toward each goal. Throughout the year, as students learn more about the specific expectations, for example, expectations under the healthy eating topic, the health teacher gives the students opportunities to revise their goals to reflect on their new learning. The Ontario curriculum for grades 1 to 12 compromises, comprises content standards and performance standards. Assessment and evaluation will be based on both the content standards and the performance standards. The content standards are the overall expectations, curriculum expectations. Sorry, I'm going to say that again. The content standards are the overall and specific curriculum expectations identified in the curriculum documents for every subject and discipline. All curriculum expectations must be accounted for in instruction and assessment, but evaluation focuses on students' achievement of the overall expectations. A student's achievement of the overall expectations is evaluated on the basis of their achievement of related specific expectations. Just a note, the overall expectations are broad in nature, and the specific expectations define the the particular content or scope of the knowledge and skills referred to the overall expectation. Once again, teachers will use their professional judgment to determine which specific expectations should be used to evaluate the achievement of the overall expectation and which ones will be accounted for in instruction and assessment, but not necessarily evaluated. The performance standards are outlined in the achievement chart, which you can see on the slide. This is provided in the curriculum documents for every subject or discipline. The achievement chart is a standard province-wide guide and is to be used by all teachers as a framework within which to assess and evaluate student achievement of the expectations in the particular subject or discipline. It enables teachers to make consistent judgments about the quality of the student's learning based on clear performance standards and on a body of evidence collected over time. It also provides teachers with a foundation for developing clear and specific feedback for students and parents and guardians. According to the growing success document, the primary junior intermediate examples that we provided were just a few examples of assessment for and as learning of SEL skills embedded into the health and physical education curriculum. Evidence of students' achievement for evaluation is collected over time from three different sources, conversations, observations, and student products. Take a look at some of the following examples for conversations, observations, and student products that can be provided as evidence on student learning in health and physical education. Evaluation is based on assessment of learning. It accurately summarizes and communicates to parents and guardians, other teachers, employers, institutions, of further education and students themselves what students know and can do with respect to the overall curriculum expectation. Determining a report card grade involves the interpretation of evidence collected through observations, conversations, and student products, combined with the teacher's professional judgment and consideration of factors such as the number of tests or examinations or assignments for evaluations that were not completed or submitted and the fact that some evidence may carry greater weight than other evidence. The grade should reflect the student's most consistent level of achievement with special consideration given to more recent evidence. On this slide is a pause and reflect question. Please think about how assessment and evaluation in your health and physical education program may look, sound, and feel like for the primary, junior, and or intermediate division. I'm going to throw the slide, next slide, over to Kristen. 
The Ministry of Education has some additional resources uh, that can support you in your ongoing assessment evaluation journey with health and physical education. We have listed here on this slide several links, um, including links to support for information for parents, the curriculum, as well as growing success, and some additional supports uh, for you to consider in terms of your next steps. The Ontario Association for the Support of Physical and Health Educators, or RASB, is on Twitter at supportphe, and you can also visit their website, um, which is listed on this slide, to learn more. As mentioned earlier, this webinar is part of a larger webinar series, and to view past recordings and to learn more about this webinar as well as others, please visit ofia.net backslash webinars, and we also encourage you to visit the blog section of ofia.net for the blog recaps for each of the webinars delivered this year. OFIA will continue to offer lesson plans to subscribing school boards, and as new lesson plans are added, they will be identified in green. Thank you, everyone, uh, to us participating in this recording, and thank you to both of our speakers today for your time and work on this valuable learning opportunity.